Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow uh, for so many people out there, uh, a real rock star, as we say here in the U.S., of uh, both public and global health. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Ambassador Dr. Jan Arne Rotigen, uh, who is Ambassador for Global Health at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway, uh, as well as a visiting fellow uh, of practice at Blavatnik School of Government, Oxford University. Uh, Dr. Rotigen has uh, served in numerous roles over the years, including uh, as Chief Executive of the Research Council of Norway. Uh, he was the founding uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, also known as CEPI, Executive Director of Infectious Control and Environmental Health at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, a founding chief executive of the Norwegian Knowledge Center on Health Services, a professor of health policy at the Department of Health Management and Health Economics, Institute of Health and Security at the University of Oslo, and adjunct professor uh, in the Department of Global Health and Population at the uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, the last couple of years, Dr. Rotigan uh, has also uh, had very important roles in chairing the executive uh, group and the International Steering Committee for a WHO solidarity trial comparing a variety of COVID-19 medicines. In 2021, uh, he was appointed uh, by the G20 to the high-level independent panel uh, on financing the Global Commons for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Uh, he was also involved in the expert group uh, uh, chaired by the G7 presidency on preparedness partnership, uh, as well as playing part of the access to uh, the COVID-19 tools accelerator working group. Uh, Dr. Rotigan has both his uh, medical degree and PhD from University of Oslo, uh, master's from Oxford, as well as a master's in public administration from Harvard. A lot of very important topics uh, to be getting into today. Uh, Dr. Jan Arne Rotigan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great having you. Um, you know, I, I would love to start off just a, a little bit about you and sort of the early days of uh, your interest in public health, because, you know, I was sort of going through your extensive uh, uh, record in the peer review literature, you know, in the very early days, you were publishing on everything from uh, uh, the endocrine disruption uh, potential of environmental pollutants, uh, the greenhouse effect on on, on health. Uh, you pu even published this really interesting uh, book review on Paul Farmer's book back in 2001 in the uh, Journal of Norwegian Medical Association. Take us into the early days. What, what got you started off in, in, in public health, if you would? No, that's uh, a good question. Um, I, I think I should say that I, I I decided to study medicine because I was really intrigued by by the subjects and and, and learning as much as possible. Um, and um, early on, I started actually doing a sort of a combined research program alongside my medical studies. So so in addition to what you mentioned, I also um, actually my PhD is on cellular calcium signaling, very very far away from public health. Um, I saw I saw those papers too. They were <laughs> yeah, exactly, and and uh, uh, but what, at the same time, I I think I've I've been always very interested in the the larger questions. The, so um, with with two professors at the University of Oslo and, and another fellow student, we we. We formed uh, a group uh, called the Patient Earth, in a way, trying to look at the big questions, not the clinical questions only. Um, it was a, the professor of social medicine and the professor of international health. Um, and both of them really inspired us to, to think about the big issues. So I think one of the early reports we, 
studied in that group and discussed a lot was the World Development Report in 1993, the first uh, report from the World Bank uh, focusing on health. So alongside my more sort of basic science uh, research, I, I did really uh, yeah, look into public health and, and, um, and worked on those issues uh, in, in different capacities. And then when I finalized my PhD, I had the opportunity to, because I had still funding, uh, and I had the opportunity to, to go to Oxford for a year as a so-called Norway scholar. Uh, and then I really, it was, a, it was a big decision of mine. Should I continue on a sort of bi basic science research program, which I had an offer to do, or, or do something else? And I decided to, to really train into infectious disease epidemiology, global health um, uh, at uh, the, the what was called at that time the Wellcome Trust Center for the Epidemiology of Infectious Disease with Roy Anderson and Bob May and others, and actually in the basement of of uh, the Blackwell's book store, uh, I found the, the the Infections and Inequality book uh, by Paul Farmer, yep. uh, which um, really inspired me and, and also inspired me because it was sort of a combination of a rigorous academic work, of course, a, a synthesis of his PhD on, on social anthropology uh, from Haiti, but at the same time, a very um, a, a book speaking very clearly about the structural inequalities that are driving infectious diseases. So I guess this sort of combining the infectious disease epidemiology with the, the understanding that infectious diseases are very much also driven by social factors and, and right. how we interact in societies. Uh, that led me to public health work, and I more um, yeah more or less worked on, in public health or, or public management positions, leadership positions after returning from Oxford. And, and in parallel to that, you know, you you also um, you know spent a lot of time publishing on, as you mentioned, sort of the broader themes and taking public health and looking at, at the big picture in terms of global health. And you know, we hear this phrase all the time. You know, what happens there? affects us here. Uh, you've written a lot about, you know, um, sort of the the need to think greater. I mean, the, the UN uh, Millennium Development Goals are one thing. We have to think, you know, even bigger than that and the concept that we have all of these um, international actors out there, a lot of good intents, but a lot of fragmentation in, in global health. Talk a little bit about that as well, because I think that's another sort of important theme in your history that go alongside your public health interests. Yeah, and, and a couple of entry points on that. Uh, one was really uh, the issues related to access to medicines, and um, but also understanding that to have access, you first need to develop the medicines. You need you need incentives for innovation. Um, I had the opportunity to to be the Norway's lead negotiator uh, from quite early on on intellectual property right uh, innovation and public health in the processes at the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, that, of course, really um, exemplifies how you need to integrate understanding across the trade sector, the, the intellectual property sector, the, the uh, of course, public health and, and, and medical and uh, clinical sectors. Uh, um, at that stage, this was back in 2005, six. Uh, I started, um, there was not a very systematic collaboration between uh, World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and, and the World Intellectual Property Rights Organization. But later on, they have formed a tripartite, uh, also trying to combine their technical capacities and efforts when necessary. Um, I, I feel in many ways, access to medicines, in, and, and that was actually the subject I also taught at Harvard um, was understanding the sort of balances you need in government policies to both incentivize innovation and ensure access. And in particular for diseases where we have seen too little um, investments in, in development of new technologies. Uh, and of course, that's uh, what we traditionally used to call neglected tropical diseases. Then yep. later the term poverty related diseases, um, because of course, it's, it's really a question of of the purchasing power and the ability to pay among on those populations. Um, but um, also understanding that uh, epidemics uh, are among that sort of family of uh, public health needs, uh, because uh, of course we there's very little incentives to develop 
new vaccines, new medicines for epidemic diseases that only hit now and then uh, and with a high uncertainty. So that's another area where governments will need to work with private sector in a different way um, than uh, for the normal sort of innovation needs in, in healthcare. And then finally, that took me also to the fields of uh, antibiotic development. And, and yep. as, as you know, we have seen uh, an emerging uh, sort of trend, negative trend in the emergence of, uh, of antimicrobial resistance or an, in particular antibiotic resistance. At the same time, we have seen fewer and fewer of the big multinational pharmaceutical companies being uh, still uh, focusing on innovating new antibiotics because of the lack of mar market uh, potential, because of the uncertainties. And yeah. uh, and also, as we know, the new, new antibiotics will never be the first line drugs. They may be second or even third and fourth line drugs. Right. Um, so they will need to be up on the shelves and only used when necessary. And, and that leaves very small profit margins and incentives. So how can we think differently on those uh, three areas as well? So so in a way, that's one space that sort of has been with me for the last 15 years is, is really thinking uh, new when it comes to uh, partnerships between public and private sector, when it's uh, both related to innovation and then to future downstream access or for medical um, technologies, in particular pharmaceuticals and vaccines. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, let, let's, I mean, it, it, that was a perfect segue into, I think we should go into each of those tributaries because I think they're all very important, uh, you know, part of this, this story. And, and, and one place, you know, as, as you mentioned, uh, the no neglected tropical diseases, uh, aka the diseases of poverty, you know, you have written uh, a lot about a theme uh, called open source drug discovery and drug development. Um, and, you know, you've written about case studies. Interestingly, from from, from your neighborhood, uh, about a year ago, we had um, uh, Dr. Mads Thompson on from the Novo Nordisk Foundation talking a little bit about uh, sort of their perspective on this in the sense, you know, here we are as Novo, we're a, a diabetes company, uh, we work in cardiometabolic health, but our assays, you know, they're pretty good for screening tuberculosis drugs and our toxicologists can, you know, look at malaria and so forth. Um, take us a little into sort of what you mean uh, in general by open source drug discovery and development. And if you could just just briefly, I mean, you also wrote this paper. I don't say we hop around here, but you've, you've written a lot of really interesting things on the subject, uh, specifically a case study on malaria. Um Take us a little into the model, if you would, as you see what open sourcing in drug discovery and development means. Yeah, and uh, and in a way that our research into that um, identified that um, we, we can use parts of the sort of open source regime, uh, but not all of it will fit right. uh, for for um, medicines development. And uh, and I and I think the starting point is really one. Um, um, Speedy sort of knowledge creation and innovation um, can happen very well and should happen very well in an open science sort of framework. Uh, so open science means rapid sharing of, of the results and data and, um, and of course, in a culture of uh, healthy competition, to put it that way, among uh, researchers and, and innovators. Um, so, so I think everyone understands and believes that open science is an efficient way of knowledge creation and development technology. But then, uh, of course, the other understanding is also that for big investments uh, in technology development, you need incentives um, for private sector to, to make upfront investments that will for downstream uh, give revenue. So that's why we introduced the, the patent regime and intellectual property rights um, and how do you balance those two needs? Uh, so open science for swift uh, uh, innovation and, and then, in a way, closed science in the sense that at least those who control the intellectual property um, uh, have the incentives and to, to invest uh, upfront uh, to then secure monopoly um, sort of pricing uh, for at least a, a limited uh, time period. Um, what on, on our original thinking on from one of the experts group I led for the World Health Organization was that 
for neglected diseases when there is very little private sector incentives for innovation, we should try to use open science approaches as much as possible because a lot of the funding also for what is traditionally done by, by companies would need to come from public sector and then open source in that sense um, uh, would be uh, useful and important. Um, and you could sort of also use crowdsourcing techniques uh, and, uh, and and a broad involvement. Uh, not, uh, I think we saw that actually during the, just as a side note, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, not for technology development, but in particular for, for bioinformatics work and, and for trying to understand early on gene sequence variants and, and evolution of, uh, of the virus. There was a lot of efficient sort of collaboration uh, and, and crowd uh, insights um, uh, through many different uh, biologists and, and uh, public health professionals working together uh, online. But back to the the open source, I, I think the the what we saw was that af, uh, as we have in the software development, an open source can work and up to a certain stage um, yeah. when it's when you really need to to pay for the large investments um, in uh, in clinical trials, but also in in uh, screening uh, targets uh, where you need more sort of infrastructure or um, capital investments, there is there is a need for incentives. Um, so either you, you then go for models for um, partnerships, public-private, or you, um, uh, you let, for instance, data exclusivity agreements ensure that there is a willingness to, to invest in, in, in clinical trials. Um, then, as you mentioned, the Novo Nordisk example, and 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 we actually have seen it also um, in in the context of of other diseases. Um, many companies have large libraries um, uh, yeah. with potential targets, and um, they have been willing for areas where with little or less commercial value to actually use those libraries. Um, and in that sense, they they partner with. Uh, non-profits uh, or so-called product development partnerships to screen uh, their in-house libraries for disease areas where they see um, little commercial private incentives, but where they see that they have insights and uh, and candidates that could potentially work. And currently I'm on the board of uh, Guard P, the Global Alliance for uh, on for research and development on antibiotics, the partnership, um, and uh, they now have or are collaborating with both companies and other um, uh, PDPs to really screen candidates for potential antibiotic activity uh, as a first sort of um, test, uh, and that. That makes it cheaper uh, and you can in a way have an open source approach until right. you then need more detailed analysis. Yeah, I think that that library, uh, I'm glad you brought that up and we'll, we'll get into that also in a little bit when we talk about repurposing. But, uh, you know, those themes of you know, these these companies, and I come out of one of them, you know, we have literally millions of compounds. And so, yeah. you know, what, what we learn, they ultimately can do for some of these other conditions. Let, let's, let, let's, with that, let, let me, let's segue a little bit into, so, you know, you, you brought up antibiotic uh, resistance, antimicrobial resistance. This has been an important topic for us. And, and aside from um, uh, Guard P, you, you were also involved in this Drive AB consortium. We've been profiling some of the folks from um, the quadripartite uh, WHO uh, UNFAO group. Um, you know, you, you've been involved in, you know, publishing on on different concepts of of how, you know, we can deal better with this. Uh, you have an interesting paper on uh, should we rethink whether antibiotics should be controlled medicines and things that we can learn from how we control uh, other drugs of abuse. Uh, you've also written about some mechanism called the transferable exclusivity voucher that that didn't work out very well. Um, talk a little bit about some of these interesting innovation spurring models uh, that you see per antibiotic development. And then a sort of a second part of that, you know, based on your uh, cellular molecular work, 
Um, there's, you know, there's other classes of stuff out there. Uh, what are there? We talk about bacteriophage, which, um, you know, has been around before the first antibiotics were discovered. And then sort of virulence factor interfering drugs that, you know, don't kill, but interfere with the, the ability of the bacteria to colonize. Your, your general thoughts on, you know, whether antibiotics in general, you know, need sort of some diversity on how we go about even looking at these mechanisms in 2023. You know, maybe first overall on antimicrobial resistance, um, I feel that is an area that is really complex uh, and, and more challenging than many other areas of, of public health currently, right. um, because we need to balance uh, what we in many areas uh, are trying to maximize, uh, for instance, maximizing access. Um, here, we cannot maximize access because we really want to make sure that Right. That drugs are only used when necessary, and and we and and of course overuse misuse will uh, will reduce the value, but the future value of of anti antibiotics. So um, so in in several papers that together with other good colleagues, uh, we have written about needing to balance the triad of uh, access, um, conservation or or stewardship, you can call it, um, yeah. and innovation, uh, and that in a way you need policy solutions that at the same time could could solve all those three sort of problem areas uh, and building of course on um, on uh, a broader sort of commitment to infection prevention and and, and uh, sanitary and and water uh, uh, requirements right. uh, clean water requirements so um on on then the and, and we've had a series of articles in Lancet back in 2015, I believe, we, where yep. we talked about sort of uh, responsible access, uh, uh, which is, of course, will require um, access only based on some level of guidance from healthcare personnel. And that is not easy in, in, an, in a developing country uh, setting. Now, as, as we know, uh, you, you can buy cheap antibiotics without any prescription without any uh, guidance from uh, health personnel. So, so actually responsible use of antibiotics will require uh, a stronger health system and, and more health personnel, not necessarily doctors, but at least someone who can help making a diagnosis and, and help making sure that they are used um, efficiently. Um, so, so combining the conservation and the access agenda. And then on the innovation side, um, as, I, as I talked about, the the, there are few incentives commercially, so we need new models for incentivizing uh, and, and maintaining private sector uh, activity in this space. Some can be done with uh, so-called push financing, where we can subsidize and support antibiotic development in companies uh, by by yeah providing support to both preclinical work as well as uh, early uh, clinical trials, thereby reducing the risks of, of private companies still uh, investing in the space. And then the other big discussion has been on pull incentives. So how can how can the market um, incentivize in a better way? And and there the problem was that if you have a unit based uh, uh, incentive in the market. So the more you sell, the more you earn. Uh, that will drive against the conservation agenda. And, right. and we don't want companies to be over incentivized to sell high volumes, in particular for new drugs that we want to be used as a third and fourth line, as I said. So that means that you, we need completely new ways of incentivizing um, than the traditional reimbursement per, per cure or per, per, per dose. Um, and in the Dry Baby program, we, we looked into some of those, uh, including the so-called market entry reward, uh, yep. that would be an sort of an advanced market commitment, but actually not paying for um, um, uh, for the drugs as such, but actually paying for the registration of new drugs with specific characteristics. That has been proven very difficult politically to sell and the and the main reason at least from my point of view is that it's a big coordination problem because as we know uh, paying for drugs are the responsibilities of healthcare systems um and are very 
a distributed decision making and and no it's a it's a sort of a free rider problem it's a prisoner's dilemma uh, right. it, you need many to coordinate and and do it together so the us of course uh, uh, can do it uh, be, being a substantial large market in europe i think we would need to have an agreement at the eu level uh, a common approach to market entry reward for instance so then an alternative model that has been proposed by some is um, and that has been used for neglected diseases in the in the us uh, um, is uh, transferable exclusivity vouchers um, i my concern is that that is a very unprecise instrument um, it will also transfer costs uh, within the healthcare system without clarity on on who should who will picking who will be picking up the bill because um, the the model will work uh, with a company with a new antibiotic will get this transferable sort of voucher right. they can sell it then on the market to um, other companies who have potential sort of blockbuster drugs in completely other disease areas and they could get one or two or some additional years of exclusivity, which would mean that they will have a higher price for a longer period, which would increase healthcare costs uh, for other areas, um, let's say cardiac diseases or, or cancer or diabetes. So my, my thinking is that we should have more precise instruments and actually rather um, go for models that they are now testing out in the in in the in Great Britain, in the UK, uh, in Sweden, uh, and are also discussing um, through the potential legislation of the Pasteur Act in the US with a, a so-called sort of Netflix model, where we where we don't pay per per sort of cure, um, but actually pay. A, uh, a prescription price in many ways for right. allowing to use an antibiotic um, in the health system, which would then be more of a, almost a sort of an, an insurance model as well. You can, uh, another way of uh, describing it. Um, so uh, I believe those models are probably the best models currently. Again, the challenge is coordination and, and the willingness to agree on this across different systems because we need in some to incentivize industry sufficiently well. So let's let's move to um, let's move to SEPI now because you, you know, you're the founding CEO. Um, you know, a couple of years prior, you're involved in uh, Ebola uh, vaccine trials. You start publishing, uh, you know, along with Dr. Gadal in, in 2015 on, hey, the we, the need to speed up uh, emergency response for unexpected things. And then, you know, obviously at CEPI, uh, you, you were focused on a lot of the really nasty stuff in terms of, you know, Ebola's here, MERS, Lhasa, Nipa, a list of other things. And then in the list, there is, you know, what is known as disease X, uh, where you define a uh, serious international epidemic that could be caused by a pathogen currently unknown to human disease. Um, I was wondering if you could say a few words about sort of, you know, your perspective on um, disease X strategies. You know, we've been talking a lot about One Health on the show, different perspectives out there on whether, you know, we should be trying to catalog, you know, the next couple hundred thousand unknown things that are out there in nature, whether we should just be looking at the hot spots instead. Um, take us a little into sort of what you think about when you think about disease X nowadays per organizations like CEPI, but also your experience like in the field doing, you know, Ebola uh, vaccine trials. Yeah, yeah, may maybe go back to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Um, and what Please. happened then was, um, of course, we had an unprecedented outbreak that was, really reacted on far too late. So I got involved in um, in August, September, I think in 2014. Uh, and, and in hindsight, we saw that that the outbreak then had already been going on nine months um, and, and really building up. So it was really unprecedented in scale. Um, and um, we were then involved in planning vaccine trials in the three countries. Um, Norway partnered with the World Health Organization, MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, Borders, and the, the authorities in Guinea, uh, partly because um, 
uh, there were already large trials planned for Liberia and Sierra Leone. Um, and we decided to use uh, a so-called ring vaccination trial approach, which was innovative. It had never been used as a clinical trial methodology. Um, and the idea was to build on how the world eradicated smallpox uh, when in the last sort of period um, you identify when new cases arose, you uh, vaccinated contacts and contacts of contacts around that individual as a more or less as a fire gate uh, strategy and, and therefore induced a very strong and, and fast immunity because the smallpox vaccine had that characteristic. So what we did was to use that experience but set it up as a clinical trial instead, uh, cluster randomizing groups of contacts uh, and giving them either vaccine immediately or after three weeks delay. We demonstrated that the Ebola vaccine was very, very effective. Um, and I will not spend more time on that, but that really led us to see that, okay, if we had been prepared, we could have started that trial immediately um, uh, when the outbreak happened and not I think we actually it took us six. No, actually, let me see. It took took us nine months actually from August uh, 2014 to to really implement the implementing the trial, which was at the late phase of the epidemic in Guinea. If we had been able to start immediately, had done phase one and phase two trials, uh, we could have saved many many lives, and we would have reduced all the the non health consequences, economic and livelihoods. Um, so that was really the business idea and uh, and the business model for CEPI, uh, saying that we need to be prepared. So CEPI then had had two strategies. One was to be prepared for the highest um, risk uh, or, or or the pathogens where we already believed there was the highest risk for new outbreaks. Then we worked with the World Health Organization in CEPI and and used their priority list of pathogens. But then in addition, addition you need to be prepared for the new the new virus, the new disease, right. the disease X, as you say. And the challenge then is then you cannot be, you, you don't have a product because but you, you can, because of course you don't know what kind of pathogen this is and, and what are the sequence, what is the characteristics, what are the antigenic, um, the, the, the best antigenic parts of, of the virus. So how could you prepare for that? And then there have been different sort of ideas and concepts some really going out there and, and trying to, to sequence a very broad number of viruses that are in the environment. Another is to uh, try to identify the most likely ones uh, of families and then prepare products for each of those and then adapt those products um, when, uh, when a disease X hits. Um, and then it's, it's uh, really also just to make sure that we develop very flexible um, platform, uh, vaccine platforms, new technologies. And of course, what was then interesting with, with um, for the COVID-19 pandemic was that CEPI had already started investing in mRNA platforms, but to a minor level, indeed for a disease X scenario. Right. Um, in many ways, um, the, the scale of the pandemic overtook the uh, the the innovation and the events, uh, the operation of warp speed uh, in the US really incentivized uh, fast development. And, and we know the history of uh, and, and how the mRNA technology really has demonstrated high value. But I think it also demonstrates that we indeed now have a, vac a vaccine technology platform that can be adapted to new pathogens. But, it, but we cannot only rely on mRNA technology. I think we need right. other other technology platforms because we yeah this is biology it's uncertain and we need uh, more platforms so a combination of the second and in a way the third strategy so trying to develop products for broad vaccine no sorry pathogen families virus families as well as uh, continuing developing uh, flexible platforms and you know that 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 feeds nicely into you know what what you were touching on before in terms of uh, sort of the library screening. You know you um, per the per the the theme of repurposing. You, know, you were involved in the um, the solidarity trial uh, per the WHO and looking at repurposing uh, some of these uh, these antiviral drugs. Um, 
you know, not great results, but nonetheless, you know, you, ha- you got some experience in, in sort of this little basket uh, focusing on COVID-19. And, and obviously, um, you know, we, we don't have a tremendous amount of material, just an antiviral development at all. Um, y- your thoughts on on just repurposing in general, uh, specifically when we think about uh, antivirals, your experience per uh, this particular clinical development a- and other thoughts around, you know, where we should be going in, in sort of the broader repurposing uh, per pandemic preparedness beyond vaccines, a la having some yeah. <laughs> better antivirals sitting around. Yeah, and, and and one, I think you are right, we, we are, I think we are much more advanced when we uh, when it comes to vaccines. When we now think about structuring our collective innovation capabilities and and actually being prepared, uh, and the so-called hundred-day mission is now a real mission uh, for CEPI, but also for partners, uh, and that we should be able to to develop new vaccines uh, hundred day after having identified a new disease X. Um, I think for antivirals, we um, there are more challenges, and and they are both sort of biological and medical and uh, but also organizational on the on the biology side um uh, of course the the specific antibody antibodies uh, monoclonal antibody approach could be sort of set up and 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 worked out in the same way as vaccine development um and and we definitely saw that uh, th- there were some very for covid-19 specific monoclonal antibodies that have been working well and and would be important for in particular high risk uh, individuals uh, and those who would uh, have harder to mount their own um, uh, immune response uh, mm-hmm. in, when vaccinated. Uh, and we would also need, I think, new regulatory frameworks for actually approving such um, uh, such uh, therapeutics, given that the virus evolve and and as we have seen now in this. This time around, we we had effective um, antibodies for the early strains, and then they were not effective anymore when you saw the Omicron uh, strain right. and variants coming in. But then, in addition, uh, more and and yeah, I should say, we also saw that maybe the most effective uh, therapeutics, that is in particular for hospital patients, have not been really antivirals, but they've been been immune modulators. So. Yep. And, and of course, immune modulators have more generic capacities and could potentially work for any viral disease, but we just need to learn more how we should use them. And, and those, I think we should have a very clear strategy on how to test immunomodulary drugs um, uh, in, in new uh, outbreaks and, and epidemics. But then back to the chemical antivirals, um, what I think I've learned from the being involved in the solidarity trial and also working alongside uh, remap cap and, and recovery, the large multi, uh, multi-country trials. One, I think we need such large trials to really uh, get solid evidence and get that evidence out quickly. Um, but we also need better screening techniques uh, before entering drugs into clinical trials. Right. I think what we saw this time around was that there was a lot of hype, uh, as we know, for for drugs that could work. Um, In that sense, it was good to have large trial that could actually document that uh, a drug does not work, because if it's used very much um, uh, in in out in the daily practice in clinical work, it's important also to avoid that patients are are being given non-effective drugs, but. But I believe what we should have invested more on early on was um, screening drugs in animal models because we saw a lot of antiviral activity in cellular cultures and in screening techniques, but that was really not transferred to a clinical impact. And I think more solid work on animal models that could screen um, and then enter drugs into repurposing trials uh, would have been a better strategy um, that could probably have increased the likelihood of, uh, of of drug hits i think in in the larger clinical trials of course the other big problem was that we we started far too many small clinical trials that never gave any conclusive answers mm. uh, given the size of, of of the trials needed 
Yeah, I mean, you, you, you mentioned um, before um, Operation Warp Speed, um, and you know we just had on the the chief scientists of FDA a couple of days ago talking a little bit about everything that's going on sort of in the regulatory environment in, in, in her shop, her emergency authorization dynamics and how that's sort of changed a little bit about the culture of, of things at FDA the last couple of years. Um, you, you wrote this very interesting paper uh, entitled Accelerating Clinical Trial Implementation in the Context of COVID-19 Pandemic, and specifically looking at lessons per discovery in the EU Solid Act um, response group. Say, say a few words about this, a little bit about sort of what you learned per sort of adaptive trials. And then, uh, you know, uh, you were looking sort of at Europe in general, and obviously many countries, a lot of diversity, a little bit of the learnings there on how sort of Europe, you mentioned sort of the United Europe of research ultimately for these situations in the future. Take, take us a little into sort of your vision here per innovating clinical design. Yeah, so maybe start first start. So if we could get sort of preclinical screening uh, of um, of drugs, um, uh, that, because that, that would need to be the starting point because we, we really want to introduce drugs in clinical trials with the highest likelihood uh, of um, the potential of, uh, of being able to work, um, then it's really about what is the clinical trial strategy. Um, and I think we should be honest to say that the country that did this the best way um, was the UK. Uh, and, yeah. and that was through a very national and strategic approach to clinical testing. Um, I, I'm not seeing the sort of overall numbers, but I think at some stage, they, in hospital patients, they were able to recruit more than 10% or and maybe up to 15% of all admitted COVID-19 patients in, in British hospitals. They were recruited into the recovery trial. And of, and, and of course, when we don't know what works, um, I think it's really important to systematize what we can learn from, from uh treating patients uh, mm -hmm. and, and the most the ethically best way of managing those patients and, and giving them the, the best treatment we can offer is actually to offer them entry into robust clinical trials that can generate results um, uh, that will they will then be able to be tested with new treatments uh, and and then the the next generation of patients will be able to to get the treatments that uh, that are documented to work and the challenge then is how do you orchestrate and or and and do that across countries because we need scale. Uh, that's why we we called for a more coordinated approach in Europe across countries. Uh, uh, that emerging coordination mechanism is is being is there now. Uh, we we have a trial coordination board for um, health emergencies and epidemics in Europe now. Um, we have a prioritization mechanism. I think the challenge though is still to link link those mechanisms and collaborations to funding and making sure that we can enter into multi-country trials as quickly as possible when a new outbreak or epidemic hits. Um, as we know, there, there were a lot of sort of ad hoc testing without uh, doing any clinical research really early on uh, when when the, the the big number of patients uh, came into European hospitals in February, March, April 2020. Um, but the problem, as I said, there were most patients not entering into clinical trials and, and some patients entered into very small uh, hospital-based trials that didn't generate the necessary results. Right. So uh, really, big multinational trials uh, is the way to go. And I think we need collaboration within Europe, but also, of course, across the Atlantic, uh, and also making sure that patients in low and middle income countries can benefit from being part of clinical trials. Outstanding. So we've been talking a lot about um, biology. Uh, let's, let's hop over to silicon for, for a moment, because uh, another sort of uh, component of your portfolio, um, which you started publishing on, you know, a couple decades ago, is digital health. Um, 
during time at the Norwegian Knowledge Center, you know, you, you talked about uh, the the Norwegian Electronic Health Library at the time and sort of wiring uh, the country for health information. Uh, you've written about sort of the importance of, of health technology assessments and evaluating these technologies. And now fast forward, here we are sitting in 2023, and there's all sorts of other permutations of this stuff out there from chat, GP, whatever we're on now to the world of Twitter to whatever classifies or accounts as digital health uh, in a 2023 world. Um, talk just a little bit about sort of the, the digital side here. What excites you? What concerns you? Um, any, any other important uh, tools per sort of the digital health realm that you want to, that you're interested in per public and global health? Yeah, no, thank you. Um... And in a way, I think the alternative to, to sort of the big pragmatic trials that I just talked about is really to use the patient administrative data in a much more robust way yep. and use population health data. Um, yep. um, and I think we have seen a lot of uh, important results, um, uh, and not at least from the United States, where you, you have now to a larger extent than previously been able to aggregate electronic patient record data and and demonstrate yeah efficacy of uh, Paxlovid uh, for instance and uh, and now more recently also uh, the mpox vaccine uh, based on mm -hmm. observational data and, and not trials um, i am though a bit concerned about biases in observational data so we need sure. to better understand those biases and better on, uh, yeah really look into them and one way of of sort of making sure that we have less bias is to really have uh, full population data sets. And uh, as you may know, the Nordic countries um, have uh, so-called personal identifiers for every inhabitant, but that means that we we can follow uh, individual patients um, in and out of hospitals uh, based on our registry data, and we can have long-term follow-up data on uh, on both side effects as a, as well of course long term clinical effects beneficial effects on both uh, yeah any technology um, I think we saw ex um, saw how those data sets could be used in this pandemic um, uh, the the side effects related to the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine uh, mm -hmm. were strongly documented through um, uh, uh, combining the the full population data sets. Um, on on those vaccinated in Denmark and Norway, um, and we could quite robustly demonstrate the the increase still as still very low risk, but still an increased uh, risk for the for the for the uh, for the bit disease as it's called with the hemorrhage hemorrhage uh, in the in in the brain. Um, yep. um, the um, and I I guess fully. Ex exploiting sort of digital health data um, could be another approach than clinical trials to really make sure that we have a learning health system uh, and that can um, can really help uh, clinicians uh, making informed decisions uh, together with their patients. Another example I know in Sweden they they have for some years now used observational data for um, for Improving uh, adherence to uh, to new bio to, to to the different regimens for new biologics in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, really based on um, data from their quality registries, uh, including all patients in Sweden on on uh, on those medications with the with those diseases. Um, so so really trying to benefit much more on the data we are generating in healthcare, and then I think. As you started to think about, is is of course the use of AI and and um, sort of non hypothesis driven uh, yeah. uh, results generation. I think we we haven't really understood that yet. I think there are many, of course, concerns related to black box uh, sort of approaches of AI. At the same time, I think it can be really powerful generating new insights. Uh, but my belief is that if, if it should be seen as generalized knowledge, we would need to then test those hypotheses that AI sort of identify as, as um, likely uh, in more robust uh, research designs. Excellent. Outstanding. 
Uh, Yana, um, I, I noticed that, you know, you've been quite um, active or maybe virtually uh, in recent months in, 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 in public facing initiatives. You've done a couple uh, recent conferences, uh, one at, at Oxford on, on co-shaping global health. Uh, uh, you're involved in uh, a panel for the Center for Global Development on, on health aid and financing health services. What what else is happening uh, as far as you're concerned for 2023 conferences that you're going to be presenting at other initiatives that you may want to highlight places that we can further listen to you potentially meet you um, anything else hot for 2023 please. No, thank you. Um, so so there are two sort of larger efforts I'm really interested in currently uh, that will come up in in both sort of academic conferences, but also more broader conferences uh, in, in this year. One is really how we can learn uh, from the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator uh, yeah. on how to ensure access, yeah, both development of and access to countermeasures in the future. Um, uh, how should we structure that? How should we collaborate? Um, and I organized a meeting um, together with uh, my South African counterpart, Olive Shisana, in Johannesburg a month ago, and, and there will be follow-up discussions on this uh, in the context of both G7 and G20, as well as the World Health Assembly that will come uh, up in in uh, in mid or late May. Uh, then the other work I'm really interested in on is, is trying to sort of use the, the learning experience I think the pandemic should be for all of us right. on how we can ensure um, more resilient health systems and and better primary health care capacities because in the end it doesn't help us to have technologies if we cannot make sure that they are delivered and used uh, in healthcare settings all around the world um, and there we have started a process uh, that we call the future of the global health initiatives and that's really okay. to to see how we can get become more effective when it comes to health financing globally? And how can we think uh, better on combining the domestic health financing, the planning, and, and of course, purposes that governments um, intend to use their resources for with um, the additional resources generated to development aid for health? Um, we, we hope there will be uh, important opportunities to discuss this moving forward. Uh, again, World Health Assembly, there will be side events and meetings on this, uh, on the margin of the Health Assembly. And then I believe the, the in the UN uh, high-level week um, uh, in September, there will be three important meetings uh, by uh, where heads of states will participate uh, on health. One is on pandemic preparedness and response. So very much related to, of course, the learning from the pandemic and to access to countermeasures as well. And then one on universal health coverage, which will definitely take up the responsibilities of countries to deliver on a sustainable development goal three, but at the same time, the need for better coordination of, of supporting the, the low income countries. And then finally, a high level meeting on TB, the tuberculosis, sure. which in a way reminds us that um, still, the, the the disease with the the highest mortality, infectious disease with the highest mortality currently, we now see we we saw um, uh, that we were really not aiming, no, able to to treat the patients needed during the pandemic. We see now, hope uh, fortunately that we now are at a better stage again, mm -hmm. being able to treat more patients, but still. As I said, uh, it's the infectious disease with the highest mortality when it comes to number of deaths each year. And also demonstrating the need for new innovation. We need, we need yeah. new vaccines for TB and, and we need better treatment regimes. Yeah, tuberculosis is always one of those that it startles me that to think that our vaccine is 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 older than penicillin. So I, you know, yes. yeah, 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 you bring us full circle. It's very sobering, but uh yeah, I mean, uh, you, the fact that you come back to global health, science, diplomacy, um, and again, the fact that we are all connected and, and need to every we all need to work together to make this uh, resilient for all of us is it, just an, an important message. And uh, I, again, I, I, 
it's been an amazing journey you've been on uh, and everything you've been doing and just I'm rooting you on, uh, continue to follow you and, and on all these initiatives and wishing you the best for them. Again, for everybody who's going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across uh, the various podcast networks or again, watching on our YouTube channel. Uh, you've been listening to the ambassador, Dr. Jan Arne Rotigan, ambassador for global health, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway, visiting professor of practice, Blatnik School of Government at Oxford University. Uh, Jan Arne, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us and educate us on this broad range of topics. Obviously, thank you for doing what you do. And as we like to say here on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people out there via what you do. It's really an amazing story. And again, I wish you the best as you continue to, to execute on it. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Yara. <laughs>